So this week is a little bit different because we're going to um, have a session that's led by Your Life, Your Story, which is a small charity of mainly care experienced adults who are just going to share, you know, what's happened to them in their lives as um, children who were in the care system and what some of the, the learning is for us today. Um, and we might think, you know, what happened to them such a long time ago and and is it still relevant? And yes, it is. It, it very much is relevant. So um, I think that some of the most powerful sessions that you can have in your social work training are really from people with lived experience. So it's a real privilege that um, we're able to do that this week. But I also have put together um, some slides on particularly on some research that was only published a year ago, which is very, very relevant to this this module. So I'm, I'm just going to take you um, through these slides. OK, so the purpose of um, this PowerPoint is to build on the understanding that I'm sure you, you have already about what, what do we mean um, by looked after children in, in our care system? Um, what is, you know, the responsibility of um, the state, of local authorities and of social workers? Um, so that, that's the first part. Um, but as I said, we're looking at some research um, because in social work, we need to be research minded and we need to be evidence based, don't we? So we're looking at some research that was um, produced last year by by Nuffield who do a lot of research um, on children and this research is is of um, significant relevance to this module because the assignment task is about a 12 year old isn't it about an adolescent uh, adolescent child and the research is um, pretty much you know telling us about a development about this um, cohort and what is happening in our courts when it comes to care proceedings and why have we got more young people of this age group coming into our care system. So that's what we're going to consider as we go through these slides. And of course, um, we need to think about the relevance, don't we, to us as social workers. Um, so what does this mean when it comes to effective social work practice? What should that look like? And some of you may have already done your placements um, working with children and some of you may be going on to do that in your final year um, and also this is this might be the route you take when you qualify as well but um, it's such an important part and area of social work because even if you work with adults you could be working with adults who've been in care as children and as young people so it is 100% relevant isn't it for all of us. The next few slides that we're going to consider contain a lot of data. Um, so this was taken from um, December 2021. I think it must have been published then. And um, it's just giving us an indication of the number of children in the care system, what kind of orders they might be subject to, because we know, don't we, that young people and children can either be um, the subject of a care order, which means that they then become looked after children or they might not actually need a court order. They might be accommodated under Section 20 of the Children Act, which again gives them a looked after children status. So what we have here is data that goes back to 2018 and takes us through to 2020. And we can see um, that the number of children um, who were subject to care orders or actually came into the care has increased, hasn't it? Over that period of time, 2018, we were talking about just over 75,000 children in care. And then if you look at 2020, uh, it's now over 80,000. And then we look at the legal status and we can see um, about three quarters of children in the care system are on care orders. So that hasn't changed a lot, has it, over the last three years? It's just gone up by um, a few percent. Then if we look at the number of children who are on a voluntary agreement, which is section 20, it's actually gone down, hasn't it? It was 19% um, in 
and now um, it's around 17%. Then we've got some children, young people that are going to be adopted. That's the um, care plan for those children. So it's a small percentage, isn't it? So in 2020, it was around 6%. Um, so we are seeing a decline of the number of children who are being put forward for adoption. And this is something that the government has got concerns about and um, there's a care review going on in England at the moment. So the government has been very active in this policy area, even going back to um, over, over 12 years ago when we had a Labour government, there's always been um, a strong emphasis about, you know, can we increase the number of children in the care system um, and perhaps look at adoption as um, permanence. OK, and then we've got a couple of other categories that are quite small compared to the ones that we, we've looked at. So some um, young people may well be looked after because of being in the youth justice system. And we may have a very small number of children who also uh, might be detained because of child protection. OK, so this time we're looking at the primary reason why children are in the looked after system. So some of those categories we're very familiar with, aren't we, when it comes to neglect and child abuse. Um, but if you look further down the list, um, we've got parents where there might be an illness or a disability. Um, we've got families in acute distress. Um, then we've got a category here, family dysfunction, um, a smaller percentage of children where they're deemed to have socially unacceptable behaviour. Um, then on number seven, it's talking about low income. Um, it's We really shouldn't be removing children from their families because of poverty issues. That That is something that um, we said as, as a state that, you know, that there's no that that it should never come to that, but you can see um, that we have got um, a small number of children where that is the case. And if we look at the bottom one, it says about absent parenting, but we also have children, don't we, that are unaccompanied children that have come to this country to seek asylum because of um, escaping conflict, escaping persecution. Um, and again, we can see that's gone up in the last one, two, three years. And, you know, now we've got another um, conflict, haven't we, with, with Ukraine. So um, it, we've got lots of issues with our immigration system at the moment. Lots of controversy about, you know, whether we're doing enough to support the humanitarian crisis. But we'll have to be we'll have to review this again, won't we? perhaps in a year's time and just see, you know, what, what that um, figure is looking like. So we have some useful information here. It's only comparing 2019 with 2020 about some um, demographics about children in the care system. So you can see um, the split between uh, male and female. OK, so we've got more boys than girls, haven't we, in the care system? And then we've got age groups. So it's broken down into um, babies and then preschool children. Then you've got the middle school children, haven't you, or the primary to the middle school and then secondary. Um, but what we are seeing is definitely um, there's been an increase in the number of adolescents um, coming into the care system. So it's it's uh, it's about 39% there, isn't it? So it's a, it's a sizable number of children. Interestingly, with ethnicity, it's telling us um, what the number is with regards to children who are described as white, but we haven't got any kind of breakdown here when it comes to children who are, are black or Asian or from minority ethnic backgrounds. So I'm not quite sure why that is um but i don't think that's very helpful and even the category white you know um what what does that mean as well so i did try to find um a breakdown when it comes to the ethnicity of children in the care system 
and the only data I could find goes back to four years ago, 2018. So it's saying again that about 75% um, of children in the care system um, are categorised as being white children. And then the next category is children of, of mixed heritage, that's 9%. Then we've got black or black British children, that would be 7%. And then Asian or Asian British children, that's 5%. And then we've got a smaller category of other ethnic groups. Okay, so we've got quite um, a large time frame here, haven't we, of 16 years from 2004 to 2020. And this is looking at um, the numbers of unaccompanied asylum seeking children coming to England. So we can see um, that there's been a, a decline, there's been a dip around, um, it's gone downwards from about 2010, hasn't it? And then it starts to climb again in 2016 and as i said you know given that we've got a humanitarian crisis on a on a very large scale at the moment um i wonder what impact that will have um when we look at the data again in a year's time so um looking specifically at unaccompanied asylum seeking children so i've taken this from kent county council and they tend to be one of the main local authorities as a as a point of entry because Dover's in Kent, isn't it? So um, they will get a lot of children who are seeking asylum coming to um, to them as a county. OK, so what they're saying is unaccompanied asylum seeking children um, will come and apply for um, the right to have asylum um, as children who are separated from both their parents and you know any other responsible adult so the duties the legal duties are um are, are on local authorities to provide children in those circumstances for accommodation and that would be um under section 20 of the children act 1989 um, so we looked at the, the data on the previous slide and we could see that the number of unaccompanied children was about 5,000 and that is down 3% on um, the peak, which was, um, I'm thinking they're talking about 2019, which was about 5,140. Um, so unaccompanied asylum seeking children, they are a distinct group of children in our looked after system. And they do currently represent about 6% of all children in the care system. In some local authorities, we've got specialist teams um, that, you know, support children in those circumstances, but not necessarily in every local authority. So what is what are some of the demographics that we know about when it comes to unaccompanied children? Um, so they tend to be males. Um, that's like about 90% of them tend to be male. They tend to be older. Um, so we've got 86% that are going to be 16 or over. Um, so obviously 16 and 17 year olds. And, um, and that was up from the previous year. So it's 85%. OK, so we are talking about 2019, whereas um, in 2018 it was 81%. And so they would come under the category, as I said on that previous slide, about absent parenting. Um, so that's how we would look at them in terms of, of that data. So unaccompanied asylum seeking children are not distributed evenly across the country. And um, they tend to be concentrated in local authorities such as Kent or Croydon. And another one would be in our region would be Solihull. Um, where we have got specialist teams um, to provide support because what we have is dispersal as well where um, you know children that are coming into the country seeking asylum may um, you know enter in Kent they might even have their claims processed in, in Croydon in London but then they might be moved out to other local authorities and Solihull is one of the um, places in this country where um, some children are also um, coming into the system to have their claims processed. Number a few years ago, we had a family justice review that looks at the whole system, and um, 
one of the biggest recommendations was we should have care proceedings dealt with within a 26 week period because some of the cases were staying in the court system for over 52 weeks for over a year and that was seen to be unacceptable the criticisms were you know children have been left to drift, drift in this system where decisions need to be made for them so you can see here over a four year period that in, in 2016 it was around about that mark but it's steadily crept up hasn't it and we're going up until um 2020 and we have to think about well why is that why is it taking longer than 26 weeks for some of these matters to be dealt with in the court what is the pressure on the system how many children are coming into the care system i mean we're seeing more and more children come into the system so what are the resource implications for that and inevitably that that's going to slow down isn't it some of the um, processes i i would say that um even though we've got a target of 26 weeks sometimes i think it's justifiable to go over the 26 weeks i don't think it's just simply about meeting the time frame but it's making the right decision for that child and if we need longer then I think you know we, that's what we need to do. I think when I talk to you about the family drug and alcohol um, courts, which are seem to be far more effective with some families where substance use is an issue, um, they were going over the 26 weeks. I think on average, there was an evaluation that said that they were taking about 39 weeks, but it's the quality of the decision, isn't it? It's making the right decision, which is supposed to be a, a decision around permanence for a child and where they're gonna be who's going to look after them, who's going to care for them. So these are very, very important decisions, aren't they, for the courts to be making and for local authorities and social workers and everybody else, um, you know, to be doing good quality assessments. Um, but yes, we can see that we are now exceeding um, the timescale that was set by the Family Justice Review a few years ago. So if when children are coming into the looked after system, what actually happens to them? So if we think about the 80,000 plus number of children in care, um, the majority of them, so we've got 72% cited here. So um, what is that? That's just over two thirds really, isn't it? Heading up to three quarters of children are um, living with, with foster carers. Um, and that can be a mixture of um, actually it could be a relative or a friend as well as um, the more sort of formalised foster carers that we have. So we also have um, children who might be living in um, secure units. So that's a much smaller number of children or, you know, we've got older children who might not be placed with foster carers, but they might be in some sort of residential units um we've we've also got a situation where we had a judgment last week where um an, an organization called article 39 took the government to court arguing that you know young people aged 16 and 17 could not be in what we call unregulated placements which is where um, the care element um, the local authority simply have to make sure that there is a provision, there is accommodation, but not so much with um, the care elements. So that sort of supervisory care element doesn't have to be there. Um, and, and again, we're only talking about, you know, young people aged 16 and 17, and that can place those young people in more vulnerable um, situations where, you know, there is less um, vigilance and support around their care and it, very sadly the government um, won um, this judicial review so I think article 39 are now going to try and appeal that and uh, I think they're doing some crowd funding as well to get support for that and to take it to um, I'm trying to think now would it be the high court the appeal, court of appeal so that's what they're they're trying to do but yeah it's really important isn't it to well, we're looking at a trend where more um, adolescents and teenagers are coming into the care system. But what is the care system? What does that look like? And how is how does it differ depending on some of the placements where children and young people 
might be so it mentions as well doesn't it about um children going into ad adoptive placements as well and we will have a small number of children that, that are placed with their family um so they can still be on care orders they can still be looked after children um, but there is a special um, provision which is placement with parents regulations as well so there are a number of different um, arrangements that children could be subject to okay so i'd like to move on now to look specifically at this research that was carried out by um, the nuffield foundation last year and it was asking um, the question about, well, why are we seeing more older children coming in to care proceedings? So this module um, with the assignment task has focused particularly on adolescents, um, not necessarily um, being, you know, an adolescent in the care system, because the case study we've looked at is about a young person who is living at home with the family in the community um, but we do need to think about the lived experience don't we of adolescents that are coming into our care system in England right now there were various um, reports that were published um, as a result of this research so one of them is um, this one here which is a themed audit of um, a sample of local authorities and so the researchers were asking this question you know why have we got more older um, children in care proceedings so they were trying to obviously answer the question by looking at what was happening um, through the eyes of, of the local authority and the data that they could um, extract from from these local authorities. Okay, so a question that they posed was, well, do adolescents make up a smaller or a larger proportion of children in care? What does that look like? Um, and so we have seen an increase of this age group. Um, so they are now a greater proportion, aren't they, of the data? And, and we're sort of comparing it over the last now we're in 2022, so I guess over the last 10 years, not just nine years. Um, so at one point, they were less than 20%. If we go back 10 years, they were less than 20% of all children in care proceedings. Um, but we can see that this has increased, isn't it? So it's almost around a third of children um, now of this age group. So it, it, they're saying here, um, this is a significant shift in England. And interestingly, we can look at regions as well. Um, and one of the regions that is notably, you know, having the sort of highest rate of um, adolescents coming into the care system is the Northeast. So again, we need to drill down on that and say, well, well, why is that? You know, why is it peculiar to that particular region in England? What might be going on there? So we're considering what influenced this research. So their interest was, um, it, they're saying the journey of older adolescents. So what they mean by that is young people aged between 15 and 17 years old, um, who were then, you know, coming into care proceedings. Um, so that's interesting, isn't it? Because we've been saying over the last few weeks, is our child protection system designed for this particular age group for older children um because in some ways you know we would say it's um it's been found wanting and it hasn't always recognized um the kind of abuse and neglect that older children also might have um experienced and and their vulnerability however um where it's very clear that there are concerns about this age group because the number of applications into court to protect these children, because if these applications are going into court, that means that the local authority believes that the threshold for significant harm has been crossed. And if you look at the second bullet point, it is you know demonstrating that 
um, the increase is pretty exponential, isn't it? In the last 10 years, it's talking about 150%. Um, and then it, that's 15-year-olds, um, isn't it? Whereas if you go to 16-year-olds, it's even um, more um, marked, isn't it? 285%. So, you know, that is why it's a really, really important piece of research because we're asking what's going on what is happening here to this age group? So I'm just reading um, the third bullet point. The number of care orders granted is of note within the older adolescent population, representing a significant level of intervention in young people's lives at that critical point when they're transitioning into adulthood. And the research found that almost a third of adolescents aged 16 and above received no final legal order outcome at the close of proceedings in England. So even though these applications were going into court, so we're talking now about young people who are aged 16 years old, not all older um, young people, if that makes sense. So we're talking about just 16 year olds, that almost a third of them didn't sort of emerge um, at the end of care proceedings with a, a final legal order. Um, so again, you know, what happened to them? Um, what was their journey then if there wasn't an order as a result of the proceedings? Okay, so we've spent um, quite a bit of time, haven't we, considering what the um, risk factors are for adolescents, for older children. So this theme comes through very strongly in this research and also the distinctions that are being made with um, the risk factors for older children compared to younger children. Um, so it's saying that increasingly, you know, it's about risks faced by um, older children and young people. It's the extra familial, isn't it, outside the family home. Um, so we talked about contextual safeguarding, didn't we, as well? And so, you know, what might be happening for young people um, when it comes to situations that are causing them harm? That could be at school, could be in public places, it could be in the virtual world, couldn't it? We know a lot about cyber cyberbullying and abuse, and that can come from peers as well as from adults. Um, and then, of course, we've got exploitation whether that's CSE or criminal exploitation, and also um, gang affiliation. So we looked at the work, didn't we, of Carleen Furman, who um, is the, the architect, if you like, of contextual safeguarding of that model. And um, we've got some other people mentioned there. Um, and these risk factors, according to Furman and the colleagues, you know, they're often um, interconnected and and interface with criminality itself, but we're talking about children essentially, aren't we? And whether these children are seen as vulnerable, or whether these children are also criminalised by the system, which does happen, doesn't it? Um, unfortunately, some of the themes um, that are identified here will hopefully resonate very strongly with the things that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. Um, there's a very, really key point here, isn't there, about all the children. So all the children that they would looked at in their research had experienced some degree of emotional harm. And we agree with that, don't we? You know, regardless of whether um, a category for the proceedings or for child protection plans, might be um, identified as, as child neglect or domestic abuse or physical harm, whatever type of abuse or neglect, um, all of these things will um, result in emotional harm. I think that's the discussion that we've had, hasn't it, when we've been together um, talking about this. So we, we also have considered cumulative harm. So it's mentioning here about, um, you know, there's more than one factor at play. We, we've seen that haven't we in a lot of the serious case reviews so it's um, just mentioning um, parental you know mental um, poor parental mental health or substance use and, and the kind of um, significance of, of that data as well as things like domestic abuse um, and it's saying these related to difficult 
and unresolved past and current experiences and to changes in family circumstances. So this story, isn't there, is it's not just about what's happening to this 15 year old today or this 16 year old today, but actually what's happened to them in their childhood at different stages in their childhood. You know, these things may not, they haven't come from nowhere. There's often a history um, that hasn't perhaps been picked up before. And then it's talking about abuse that takes place out of the home, extra familial concerns were present for a quarter of the children, 25% of children in the audit, um, 18 children from 12 families. So that's um, the number of children that they were um, researching. The family story showed that the children were not in proceedings because of either intrafamilial or extrafamilial harm. Rather, they were on a continuum of extrafamilial safeguarding concerns that varied from low to very high. And these external concerns were in addition to the intrafamilial reasons for issues, for the, for the proceedings being issued. So you've got a combination there, haven't you, of concerns about intrafamilial abuse, but then um, coupled with that, you know, what's also going on outside of the family home? And that was on a continuum, wasn't it, from, from low to very high. So there's a lot to unravel there. So um, again, in, in the module with, with the assignment, you know, I've been really encouraging you to think about Charlene and maybe what, you know, might make her particularly vulnerable to whatever form of um, abuse we're sort of hypothesising, aren't we, whether it's um, intrafamilial or extrafamilial. Um, so when you look at this slide, you might just want to um, enlarge it if you're like me struggling to, to read it um, but there's lots and lots of different factors here that are really really important that we need to consider as social workers so the first one is about the family the home isn't it um, about you know we, we, we've said about Charlene perhaps she's not thankfully at, at this level of risk about missing from home or or absence from school um, but you know we're looking at things like are there fractured relationships so this is from their research isn't it this is fact taken from their research so you know we're looking at yes whether there are fractured relationships um it's talking about violence to parents as well um and then you can see there's different categories as you move down that list um you know it's talking about exploitation isn't it and risky behaviors and um you know with peers as well physical and and mental health really important um what about you know young person's experience of loss and and trauma so there's different um sub bullet points there that you can look at um and again it's it's looking at other forms of trauma as well so yeah it's really important isn't it to think about the vulnerability of young people so this is taken from the work of Fermin, Rowe and Lloyd. So um, this research doesn't just concentrate on, um, on the problems, but it also looks at a bit like the triennial um, analysis of the case reviews, you know, what is good practice, what makes a difference? So it's saying, again, we're very interested in multi-agency working, aren't we? So it said that, you know, they found in their research that there was some highly imaginative um, multi-agency type work going on, which really did help and was effective when it came to safeguarding children. Um, the second point is very interesting because what we've seen in the recent years, very sadly, is lots and lots of cuts to um, youth services, for example, but they're highlighting youth justice involvement, aren't they, specifically, and saying, you know, um, this could be effective when we have early intervention responses, you know, rather than waiting for things obviously to become uh, much more serious. So you'd, you'd have the police and the youth justice services working together and that could potentially make a difference. They're pointing out that school could be um, a safe haven. So we could say a protective factor, they're talking about a positive factor, and, you know, for Charlene, 
<clears throat> school could have been, couldn't it, or could be a source of con continuity when there might be other things in her life that are disruptive or stressful. Um, so why does all of this matter? Well, it's saying in this research that the teachers who boosted the confidence, um, you know, with, with young people and with the parents as well, that did actually make a difference. Um, and they were surprised to find no mention of education welfare services bar one reference to a mother who'd been, prosec who'd been prosecuted because her children weren't going to school. So in their research, um, that didn't come up. And yet you'd think, well, surely a, a, a number of these children would have had intervention from an education welfare service. So that's curious, isn't it? That that didn't happen. Um, then they're talking about children's health needs, which go across the age range. And they, those health needs were identified only after the proceedings had started and the children were in care. Um, so they said this occurred in separate cases in, involving ADHD, um, autism, sleep disorder, complex trauma. So again, you know, our awareness of things around um, particular spectrums, conditions, mental health and trauma, really, really important. But this only sort of really came to light, didn't it, when they were in the proceedings. The auditors noted that some children were reluctant or, one, or, or unwilling to accept child and adult mental health services and um, other offers of help. And that could be, couldn't it, around issues to do with stigma, particularly for this age group, you know, being very, very self-conscious of the, the labels and how that could be perceived in society. In the main, however, um, they're saying those who were enabled to access support, they did begin to make some progress. So that support made a difference, didn't it? Um, and some children were being helped to explore their feelings in creative ways. And then it's talking about things like um, perhaps through the medium of songwriting or sport. So that's been relationship based. That's been child centred because it's saying, well, what does this child relate to? What do they like to do? And then hopefully if you've got workers who can pick up on that and really focus on that, and that, that, that can be a really good medium into it has a therapeutic element as well, doesn't it? Working with children and young people. But it does really emphasise the importance of um, children and young people, you know, having that recognition around their mental health and getting the support. But, you know, thinking about some of the barriers as well um, that exist in society. So we have an interesting um, title, don't we, for this slide, Reflections, Treading Water is Not Enough. What do they mean by that? So they're saying that we must take opportunities to actually do things differently, to help children in a different way. Um, and we do need to get in there earlier. So it's saying through earlier attention to any sort of difficulties that come to the surface. Um, OK, and this also is about how we not just work with a young person, but also um, the needs of parents as well. So it's a bit of a, a holistic um, approach. So I don't know, you might have heard of think family, think child, um, rather than just focusing on one or the other, which again, we've talked about that, haven't we, when we talked about the Hertfordshire family safeguarding model, for example. So it's looking at it through the lens of family. Um, and we also need to have, and I really do agree with this, a better understanding um, of complex trauma, because that can be for the adults and the children. And how, you know, to be trauma informed is so vital, isn't it? And how um, it impacts on the person and their ability to respond. What does that look like when somebody is under threat and in distress? You know, so how can we be better at uh, meeting people's needs in those situations? And then it's just, again, um, you know, reminding us of some of these themes that we ourselves have been um, looking at during this module. So we've got substance use and domestic abuse and mental health. You know, so issues again around um, cumulative harm 
and we know how significant that is. And what about um, how can we support children if they are going to go back home? They might be on a, a supervision order as opposed to a care order. Is there a danger that we're just going to have a revolving door and more repeat proceedings? So what can we do to change that? Um, so it's saying that we need to be prepared to take a case to the family court, not just kind of like, you know, wait for things to get really um, deteriorate and get worse. But if we're seeing, which is kind of, again, what the assignment's about, you know, if we're looking at indicators that things, you know, aren't going well um, and they're likely to get worse. So that's our hypothesis, isn't it? That maybe we're trying things and actually it's not working. Um, so we, we might try to, we have services called edge of care, which are designed to um, help children to stay at home. And that would be about, you know, intensive support going into the home and, and, and trying to avoid, um, you know, long periods of, of young people and families being separated. But it's going to depend on the resources, isn't it? Um, and, you know, when things are very stretched, it can be very difficult. But of course, with the best will in the world, it is better for us to um, intervene in these um, situations a lot sooner. So it's actually saying that we should be, you know, looking at children of primary school age um, who are vulnerable. So that's years five and six before they even make that transition into secondary school. So that's very interesting. And we should be having more joined up services. Um, so we need to have better and earlier connections between children's services and the youth justice system. Sometimes those two um, services can be very separate and uh, they're very, you know, two different worlds, but actually should they be? And the researchers are saying, no, they need to join up a lot more. Um, and we need to have up-to-date literature review of specific issues that are relevant for this particular age group and their families. Um, but in the overlapping but separate and sometimes siloed systems and services. So, you know, that's the criticism, isn't it? That we do need to be well informed, which kind of justifies our assignment, doesn't it? Because it's all about us having, you know, relevant knowledge, awareness and understanding. Um, but we do need to have really good multi-agency working and information sharing and all the things that, you know, we talk about. Um, infinitum, if you like. It's quite troubling um, to read this slide. Um, I used to work with um, younger people who were, were homeless or at the risk of homelessness, 16 and 17 year olds, um, quite a lot. And, and they would end up in what was called, what is called unregulated accommodation, which would pretty much um, rather than decrease the, the risk of significant harm, it would increase it because they'd be targeted. You know, they were vulnerable. They might be living in semi-independent accommodation. And in inevitably, that's going to attract, you know, the wrong kind of people, isn't it, um, into their lives that then they might start targeting them and manipulating them and exploiting them. And that often happens because these perpetrators, they know, don't they, where some of this provision is. Um, anyway, so the research is only really stating um, what we do need for young people, vulnerable young people in these situations. It says we must resolve um, to bridge the yawning gap when it comes to suitable provision for the older children that we're talking about here because of recognising that they have got a really complex um, set of circumstances and difficulties and they need to be cared for. They don't need to be seen as, well, they're older, you know, they're a bit more able to take care of themselves. Well, that's that's not the case. And sometimes we'd say to the government, you know, would that be good enough for, for your child? Or some of us are parents, you know, would that be good enough for our children? Um, so it has an adverse impact um, if we don't have you know, the right kind of provision to take care of these young people, then how's that going to impact on their safety, on their development? Um, it, it's really frustrating for practitioners. That's noted there, can really identify with that and managers and also their families when it comes to finding suitable um, placements and provision for these young people. This has been going on for too long. It's basically saying 
and uh, they're arguing that you know the young people should have access to small safe um, types of, of accommodation where you know it should be kind of based on a therapeutic um, principle doesn't it about you know recognizing the trauma that they've experienced in their lives and how that how they can be supported um, with some kind of um, recovery if you like from that trauma and then how you can then help those young people to think about their future and what they would want in the future and school is seen as something that's really important running alongside this um, for, the, for these young people or whatever type of um, education or training they might be in. However, the absence from school is a trigger for heightened vulnerability. So, you know, um, we must remember that not every single young person is having a great time at school. And for some of them, that could be the place where the trauma is. But um, on the other hand, you know, for a lot of young people, school could be that, that safe haven, as it said, on the um, other slide. So as social workers, you know, we want to support young people to remain in school. I used to do that because I used to work with young people in care um, and often they might be um, being threatened with, with exclusion, whether that was temporary or permanent, but I'd spend a lot of my time advocating um, to the um, LEA or to the schools about, you know, how can we keep this young person safe and you know, how can we avoid them being excluded and get support for them and for the school to see, you know, the, these are vulnerable young people. OK, and the last point here is about acknowledging and harnessing um, what secure accommodation can provide for some children. So that's only for some children um, who, who might be in secure accommodation. So the audit shows um, it's, it helps to compensate for lost education, it enables children to engage in activities and self-development programmes. It allows children to get warm support from staff and it can enable access to therapeutic help after release. So secure accommodation is, is different to, um, you know, maybe being in a residential children's home because this is a, a provision only for some children who are deemed to be um, you know, at risk um, in the community, maybe through exploitation, they might be a risk to themselves, they might be a risk to others. So we can get a court order that says they need to be in secure accommodation for a certain period of time. So that's what it's talking about here. So further research is needed to understand outcomes for children in secure accommodation and what type of care is most beneficial. So secure accommodation is an interesting category. Um, so some people, think you know it is a really important provision and it can be really beneficial but there are people who would argue um maybe not so um i think when i work with some of the young people that were in secure accommodation the young people that i work with tended to say that might have been the first time ever um that they'd felt safe in their lives but i think one of the things i did worry about was you know what they were coming out to because they were in this environment that was so different um, because, you know, it was quite a protected environment. And I just think if they're going to go back home or back to the community where they they were, they came from, and um, then, you know, that transition in itself is really important. And how are we um, giving young people the skills to manage that transition? Because to go from a completely protected environment to one that, you know, could be um, pretty sort of <laughs> opposite to that. It's quite a big stepping stone, but I do think some um, secure accommodation can be really beneficial to some young people at a critical point in their lives. So this slide is called um, Maintaining the Lifeline. So it's recognising that a lot of young people um, unfortunately, you know, and it's talking about young people that have experienced abuse outside of the home. Um, they've, they've had so much trauma in their lives. They've had so many different fractured, broken relationships. So this is pretty much coming from a restorative perspective, isn't it? Um, so it's saying here, you know, what could be done to try to restore some of these fraught and fractured relationships um, 
which might be with the young person, their parents, their brothers, their sisters, other relatives. It doesn't have to be just people they're related to. It could be, you know, whoever is significant in their lives. Um, so what can can we do? So we're kind of drawing on restorative approaches and relationship based practice here, aren't we? And bringing them together and saying, you know, that is something that we need to be really interested in and concerned about as um, social workers. So it says added to this, the value of professionals being curious. So professional curiosity when children have lost those connections and then being diligent about exploring what they might have to to offer. Um, because, you know, we can say, oh, a child or young person's being removed. Maybe a care orders come into play. And that was, you know, um, done with the best interests of that child or young person. But then think about the disruption that child or young person has now experienced because they've been removed from maybe their family home, their community, maybe even their school. And that's a lot of fractured um, relationships, even if some of those things were causing them harm. Um, so what can we do, you know, moving forward um, when it comes to the needs of that young person and um, their needs for connection? So what do we know about um, these young people and their families in this research? What we do know is most of them were known to children's services um, before we came to this stage in their life with the care proceedings. So there's history here, isn't there, between local authorities and the families. Um, so only 18% were not known when the proceedings needed to be issued. Um, and then one of the nine families, it was found out later on, there had been substantial contact, but maybe with diff a different local authority. Um, yeah, and then it's saying here, isn't there, isn't it, about um, some had also needed um, police protection as well in the past. So it's important to consider um, the various stages of local authority support. It's again emphasizing, you know, the multi-agency working, isn't it, in terms of information sharing. Um, and then we can look at the, the different categories um, that a child might have already been through. So whether it was child in need or child protection, and maybe um, there'd been a number of times that a child had been subject to a child protection plan. So repeat registration so what again can we learn from that about the decisions that are made for these young people and what is their lived experience when it comes to um, abuse and neglect and again you know are we talking about um, at different stages of their life are we talking about intrafamilial extrafamilial either or, or or have both of those things been a factor in their lives it's saying here that almost half of the children were already in care, even when the proceedings had started. So they might have been, you know, it might have been the voluntary um, Section 20, couldn't it? Or, or even through police protection. And it's also saying that a fifth of the families, they, they went through the pre-proceedings process. So we have a process where um, before we go into proceedings, can we do work? with families, which may mean, you know, not having to go to um, the court and apply for an order. Or on the other hand, we might satisfy the court that we've done everything we can and there is a real need for um, a care order. So um, and, and almost a third of the families, this was the second set of proceedings for the children um, in terms of care proceedings. OK, we might want to compare the reasons or the grounds for the proceedings for these young people compared to um, the categories of um, abuse and neglect and um, for child protection plans. So there are some differences here. So we can see that emotional abuse is um, the most prominent, isn't it? That's for 100 percent of these children, and young people. Because in a way, all types of abuse and neglect are going to lead to emotional abuse. But this is recognised 
for these young people subject to care proceedings that they have suffered. So the threshold for significant harm has been met and the court has found that these children have suffered and experienced emotional abuse. Then the second um, category would be neglect here. So that's almost 80% of the children in, in this research. The domestic abuse category, that really um, resembles what we know in um, child protection plans, children in need, referrals, and also serious case reviews. It's about half of the cases in this cohort. Um, physical abuse, so remember we're looking at older children and over 40% of them have also suffered physical abuse. And then we think about sexual abuse, which has to cover CSE as well as, um, so it's intrafamilial and extrafamilial, and that's still um, significantly lower, isn't it, compared to the other categories and fits with um, our wider concern about, you know, what is going on for children and young people who are being sexually abused and the fact that it's underrepresented in our data, which really, you know, does raise so many issues. Okay. So this time we're looking at um, these young people in relation to the concerns um, the agencies had about parenting capacity. So we can see again some familiar themes coming up with um, substance use and um, mental health as well. Um, and also you've got learning difficulties there as well. OK, it just says that the audit didn't seek details about the specific nature of the mental health problems or tra traumatic experiences that affected the parents' ability to provide safe care. But many parents were recorded as having a psychiatric or a psychological assessment during the proceedings because courts can ask for that where they have got concerns. So this slide um, addresses concerns about the children themselves. And we can see that three um, themes are coming up here. So we've got the yellow, which is children who are deemed to be beyond parental control. And then I'll just say it's orange. It's, I wouldn't completely say that was orange, but anyway, so just to make a distinction, we've got children who are um, assessed as having emotional and behavioural difficulties. So that seems to be the most significant, doesn't it, in the chart there. And then also, um, what about, you know, children with disabilities? How much is that an issue? And we can see that um, it, it is coming up, isn't it, in a number of the um, local authorities um, that have been sampled there. OK, um, so the first point is saying, you know, how important is it? Um, things like correlation, isn't it, between children coming into care and, and also being children who've um, got an education, health and care plan. And that's a significant number of children, isn't it? So just under a third have got an EHCP. And don't forget, not every child who has got additional needs has necessarily been assessed um, and, and, you know, formally and has an EHCP. So this could still be an underestimation about the number of children um, who are deemed to, to have um, additional needs. And then the second bit there about a number of our other children um, were also missing or disengaged from education. So that in itself becomes a bit of a risk factor. But they're not, as I said, they're not necessarily on an EHCP. Um, because actually it could be quite difficult to get that for a child um, when they're beyond year nine. That's not an easy thing to do. And a further two children had experienced frequent um, change in school um, in year seven, either before or after coming into care. So that was obviously, you know, really difficult time, isn't it? They're only just making the transition from primary school to secondary school and then um, they're also having a change of school as well and as it says there you know that would be very unsettling wouldn't it for that young person so we've certainly been um, very interested in vulnerability factors in this module and specifically considering Charlene 
and her situation in the case study. Um, so this is something again that's highlighted in the research. So we, we, we're looking at a total of 34 children um, where there were vulnerability indicators of harm that were extra familial, so coming from outside of, of the family. Um, and, and what we also saw in this research was young people's exposure to not just one um, risk factor, but it says a high number of risk factors, which is mirrored a little bit in our case study, isn't it? So these could be experienced by a young person simultaneously or, you know, um, I suppose you could say cumulatively over a period of time. So that's evidence of cumulative vulnerability and high risk for the young people. So in three of the local authorities, the children were judged to be at high risk. Um, there were fewer indicators logged for the five children in, in the fourth sample that was local authority D. Okay, so that brings us to the end of um, this PowerPoint. Um, I've just tried to highlight, you know, some of the key themes that have emerged from this research from September 2021 from the Nuffield Foundation. But by all means, um, please look at the research, you know, in in greater detail, have a look at some of the reports, because it's really important for us in um, social work to try to keep up to date with the latest developments and make sense of that. So that, you know, our um, practice is also evidence informed. Um, so I, I hope that's really, you know, been helpful. And again, who knows, you might be on a, on a placement where some of this is incredibly pertinent to um, your final placement. Okay, thank you.